the end of a loyalist supergrass trial that cost the taxpayer millions of pounds. What's your action? Oh, supergrass systems. The action that sucks. But it's justice today, no? It's not that cool. Nine men acquitted of murder after the testimony of two state witnesses, the Stewart brothers, was found to be infected with lies. I think it would have been obvious to anyone examining the case in any kind of detail before the case was brought that this evidence wouldn't stack up in court, certainly to convict uh, prisoners beyond reasonable doubt. The failure of the modern-day supergrass system could have serious implications for another case police are planning to bring involving a former loyalist boss. Gary Haggerty is one of the highest ranking loyalists to turn Queen's evidence. He could implicate the entire top tier of the UVF, along with at least one police handler and their superiors. If the Stuarts are at the bottom of that organisation, Haggerty was at the very top. And he could open doors into all sorts of places and all sorts of worlds that people don't want us to look into. So what is being done to investigate those alleged to have colluded with killers? The UVF trial that ended in the acquittals of those charged with Tommy English's murder was the result of a groundbreaking report by the former police ombudsman Nulla Olone, known as the Ballast Report. As a consequence of the practices of Special Branch, the position of the UVF, particularly in North Belfast and Newton Abbey, was consolidated and strengthened over the years. The report examined a catalogue of killings of up to 15 people over a 10-year period, carried out by a UVF gang in North Belfast. Most significantly, the Ombudsman believed the gang was riddled with police informers. Nulla alone recommended that two investigations be carried out as a matter of urgency. One into the Loyalists who carried out the murders, which led to the recent unsuccessful prosecutions, and the other into allegations that some police handlers and controllers may have allowed agents to get away with murder. Tonight, Spotlight can reveal that five years on, the investigation into allegations of police collusion appears to be going nowhere. Nulla alone talks exclusively to us about her deep concerns over what she sees as her successor's failure to follow through on her recommendations to pursue those officers and their superiors who she suspected of colluding in murder. I don't quite understand why no action was taken because there actually is a statutory duty where there's a serious crime to investigate. My belief is that the current Ombudsman is under the same statutory obligations as I was and that these matters should have been investigated. If you have police officers who are handlers or controllers who may have committed crime, that needs to be dealt with as a matter of priority. It really needs to be dealt with as a matter of priority, particularly where the crimes are murder. The police Ombudsman says all cases will be investigated and it operates in full compliance with its statutory duty. But how high did the alleged collusion with murder go? And what else do the supergrasses have to reveal? It's not just about the UVF, because these people may well be the puppets on the end of strings. Where do the strings lead? Uh, and who uh, developed the practices and policies uh, of that dirty war uh, and that dirty place? Halloween night 2000, traditionally a family time. In Newton Abbey, Tommy English and his wife were at home with their three young children. Tommy English was a one-time UDA boss in North Belfast who had recently become involved in the peace process. He was a prominent member of the UDP. Just after tea time, Tommy and his wife Doreen were watching television in the living room. Their children, aged 10 and under, were playing upstairs. Hearing a noise, Doreen English opened the back door to find a gang of men putting on masks, ready to sledgehammer their way into her house. They were pushing me and shoving me and slapping me about with the guns to get out of the road and just 
chaos, really. The biggest guy, he aimed the gun again, and I went for his face, just for his eyes, to try and stop him, see, seeing what he was doing. And after that, I was hitting the head and the face with the gun and punched it a few times. Tommy English was shot in the back as he tried to run upstairs towards his children. He stopped and sort of stared. And all of a sudden, two men came to the bottom of the stairs. And just really, it was really just bangs. You were, you were, you were hearing bangs and sort of blinking with the shock of the bang. And my dad started to fall backwards down the stairs. Uh, he landed in the hallway. They'd, they'd beaten my mum so bad, she was literally blood smeared all over her face, her clothes. We actually thought it was my dad's blood. The gunman left, and Mark's young sister Charlize ran into the street. I ran out the, the door, screaming for help in my poor feet, and I, start, I got to the neighbours and bashed their window, screaming for help, saying something's happened to my daddy, I need help, and they told me to go away, but I think they thought it was a Halloween prank, and so I just kept running and screaming. Minutes later, two of the gunmen came back. They ran to Thomas first, checked Thomas, and. I lifted the phone and I could hear what sounded to be the biggest one shouting, get back here now and finish the bastard off. Three times he shouted that and I was phoning for an ambulance. And then I started screaming, please leave him alone. Don't shoot him again. And the smaller one shot him again. Mark English and his twin brother Thomas Jr, pictured here as toddlers, were beside their father as he lay dying at the bottom of the stairs. We were terrified, really terrified. We couldn't stop screaming. We sort of sat, stood for a while and in shock. We couldn't move. We were screaming. It was absolutely horrendous. Horror fan for a child of that age to watch their own parent die. Soon after the murder, police contacted Doreen with news of a potential lead. A man had been caught on CCTV buying the sledgehammer which had been used in the attack. But Doreen English was about to get a terrible shock. They brought me in and asked me if I would be, if I would look at photograph to see if I knew the person in it and it was horrendous. I just couldn't believe my eyes. The man she was looking at in the footage is her brother, Neil Pollock. It was one of the worst things I've ever had to do was to say that's my brother, you know. It was just heart-wrenching. Doreen helped to raise her young brother, seen here as a page boy at her wedding to Tommy. Neil would join the couple on family holidays. Every day at the trial, Doreen faced her brother in the dock. He was found guilty of possessing an item intended for terrorism and of intent to pervert the course of justice. But Doreen believes he knows a lot more about her husband's death. What would you say to your brother Neil today because he could help put your husband's murderers away? Well, I would just say Neil and my daddy brought you up with more morals and I am just dumbfound that you haven't had the decency in you to do the right thing. And I know it's a hard thing to do, to tell the truth when there's so many people out there that's wanting to harm you. 
but I don't know how you're going to live with yourself if you don't do the right thing and tell what you know. At the time of the murder, police said that the death was part of a bloody UDA-UVF feud, but Doreen says she believes there may have been deeply personal motives for the particular selection of her husband as a target. Asked by police if she knew of anyone who wanted to do her husband harm, she named two men. One was this man, Mark Haddock, who's just been acquitted of the murder. Haddock and Thomas never seen eye to eye for the simple reason Thomas was in the UDA. He was in the UVF. They had a lot of run-ins and it was more like a macho thing between them. Thomas wouldn't back down to him. And they just hated each other. And the other was this man, John Bond, who was also acquitted, Doreen's brother-in-law, who was married to her sister, Christine. Christine Bond had had an affair with Tommy English. They lived together for about four months. She had left John for Thomas, and then Thomas left her, and she finished up back with John. Apart from her brother, the only two people who have been convicted of involvement in the murder of Tommy English are the Stewart brothers, Robert and Ian, who in August 2009 became assisting offenders. Doreen English says police told her that the brothers had handed themselves in just weeks after coming upon the scene of a motorbike accident in which her son, Thomas Jr., was killed, the boy who was beside his father as he lay dying. According to police, the incident had a profound effect on the Stuarts, who later confessed their role in the murder and implicated 14 other loyalists in up to 30 offences. <laughs> they said that, that said that they'd been having a hard time dealing with their part in Thomas's murder and that our son died in a wee motor bike accident and they said that they passed the scene that night that he died and saw him and after that they went to England for a couple of weeks and then basically couldn't live with themselves. It was like the last straw for them that broke their back, so they handed themselves in. To Charlize, the only good thing that came out of her brother's death was the impact it appeared to have had on the Stuarts. You always ask your what ifs and whys, and I went to myself, this is why he's died, to give us justice. That's Thomas's reason, you know, you could have had that. I always went to myself, this is justice for us. He's died for justice. But I also said to myself, it does show the brothers do have remorse. But there can be little doubt that the Stuarts' decision was also influenced by the fact that they got 15 years off their sentence for murder. In his judgment, Justice Gillen described the Stuart brothers as ruthless criminals and unflinching terrorists whose evidence was infected with lies and whose memories had been ravaged by years of illegal drug taking and alcohol abuse. Rather than turning over a new leaf, these were, said the judge, obviously the same man wearing new suits. Robert Stewart also admitted to police that he had had sex with a series of underage children. Revelations about the brothers' addictions and their criminal past raise a number of hard questions for the prosecution service and the police, given that the case cost in the region of £15 million. How could the Public Prosecution Service have deemed the brothers to be credible witnesses, given the lack of any compelling supporting evidence? The PPS director, Barra McGrory, recently told the BBC he was satisfied there was a case to answer. There is a basis for being extremely careful in the weighing up of the evidence in a case, in every case, but particularly a case such as this. Uh, but I'm certainly satisfied that there was, a, um, there was a very careful consideration of the material in this case. The police spent two years assessing the Stewart brothers, but stressed that the deal was a matter for the PPS. They told Spotlight, the agreement under the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act 2005 is one between an assisting offender and the public prosecution service, not police. It would be inappropriate to comment. While the murder of Tommy English was one of a number of killings investigated by the former police ombudsman Nula Olone as part of Operation Ballast, 
The report itself had been triggered by the father of a murder victim. Raymond McCord had brought a complaint to her office in 2003. He believed that his son had been murdered by members of a UVF gang and that the police investigation had been hampered because the killers were special branch informers. In the course of the investigation that followed, Nula Olone looked again at up to 15 murders, which she suspected had not been properly investigated by police, because at least four of the chief suspects were special branch agents, actively involved in UVF murder operations. Of the four police agents mentioned in the ballast report, informant one is now widely believed to be this man, Mark Haddock. He was one of the two men whose names Dorian English says she gave to police on the night of her husband's murder. Mark Haddock was actually arrested for questioning shortly after Thomas was murdered and he was actually found to have documents in his car with Thomas's name, address, registration and make of car. Nula Olone's report confirms that there was intelligence linking informant one, Mark Haddock, and three of his associates to the English killing. They were arrested a week later, but provided alibis for each other and were released without charge. I first investigated Mark Haddock in 2006. At that stage, I was unable to name him for legal reasons, but I spoke with the man who first recruited him as a CID informer at the age of 17. Speaking publicly for the first time, retired officer Trevor McElrath told me that alarm bells began ringing after his agent was recruited by Special Branch in 1991. He heard reports that Haddock had been arrested as the driver in a suspected murder, only to be released later without charge. He couldn't see, seemed to be the only one that got away. The, the gunman was caught, he was a driver, so he was caught too. He spent, I can't remember whether it was six or nine months on remand, and then one day the charges were withdrawn or dropped by a director of public prosecution. But from the moment he got into the murder car, he was never going to be prosecuted for that murder bid? No. Because he was an informer? Correct. In 2006, Michael Rath was adamant that he had alerted his superiors to the fact that an agent was out of control, but he was repeatedly ignored. How high up did this go? Senior ranking policeman would have yes. known. Yes, senior ranking policeman. In the 1990s, most of the UVF's victims in North Belfast were loyalists, members of their own community. But some of the attacks on local nationalists were purely sectarian including the one Mark Haddock and his gang are alleged to have carried out on this man, whose case was also re-examined as part of Operation Ballast. In March 1992, John Flynn worked for a Catholic taxi firm near Mount Vernon. One evening, he was called to White Abbey Hospital, where a gunman was lying in wait. I'm down to Ward 5, hit the horn, we'll be up out. Two minutes later, somebody appeared out of the darkness. We agree, who did tap? Who did the weapon? It didn't go off. So I ran and he ran after me. I fell and he stood over me. And the weapon didn't work again, you know. I don't know where I got the strength from, but I got off the ground and I went and grabbed him and the weapon. I knew once I got my hands on it, that I had a chance, you know. He wouldn't let go of it, I wouldn't let go of it. The two of us were fighting with our heads. So I lifted him, clean off the ground, the two of us, through the window, in the doctor's surgery at White Abbey Hospital. Was the attacker masked? No. What did he look like? Well, I give a photo, photo fit in the in the police station, and a he, dark hair, short dark hair, skinhead types, moustache, well built, tattoo. Where was the tattoo? On his arm, arm. 
The description resembles some of the details of Mark Haddock's appearance. Trevor McElrath said he remembers that intelligence sources at the time pointed to Haddock. Agents after that told us that Haddock had done that. John Flynn says he believes the attacker's prints were on the gun which was left at the scene and possibly his blood on his clothes. In 1997, the UVF tried to kill him again by putting a bomb under his car. Well, two days later, I got a mask card, through, posted through, through, through the door. Uh -huh. And it said on it, third time lucky, a UVF Tigers Bay. In her report, Nula Olone concluded that the collusion was systemic. She found evidence that police had withheld information about agents suspected of murder and subjected informants to sham interviews before releasing them without charge. She also found that Special Branch had routinely destroyed a mass of forensic and documentary evidence linking agents to crimes. Nula alone was convinced that this was a deliberate strategy and that junior officers could not have operated as they did without what she called knowledge and support at the highest levels of the RUC, PSNI. It was very, very shocking. It remains shocking to this day. And where we had found clear evidence of collusion, where we had found clear evidence um, that crimes which had been admitted to, crimes of which police were aware had not been prosecuted, um, crimes which clearly required proper investigation and hadn't been investigated. Nula Olone was so shocked by the potential scale of the collusion that she recommended that not only should the killers be investigated properly, but also, at the same time, allegations that handlers and their superiors had been involved in murder. But so far, not a single charge has resulted from the second investigation. So why has one of the investigations fallen so far behind the other? In 2007, the Historical Inquiries team was asked to implement the recommendations of the Ballast Report. The lawyer who acts on behalf of some of the victims says that his impression was that the HET was making good progress. The Historical Inquiries team were getting their teeth into this case, uh, as I understand it, and were examining all aspects, including the sensitive issue of the investigation of handlers. In 2009, the investigation into loyalist killings was transferred from the HET to the police's serious crime branch. The police said this was the most appropriate mechanism to take the work forward, and the investigation of the police handlers and controllers was transferred to the Ombudsman's office. But three years later, there appears to have been little movement. We understand that as recently as last month, there were just two officers assigned to the investigation of handlers and controllers suspected of involvement in serious crimes, including murder. A situation which we understand the Ombudsman has attributed to a serious lack of resources. Nulla alone says if that's the case, it's just not good enough. I tell you something, it is possible to do this with maybe a dozen members of staff. It is possible to do it. And certainly of the, the number of investigators that the police ombudsman has, and with the number of investigators, certainly whom I had working on historic cases, we managed to do it. If you were still the ombudsman, would the investigation of handlers and their controllers be your priority? Oh, I would have carried on from where I left off as the... Um, as the evidence began to come through from the police investigations, I would have been proceeding with, with my investigations. We asked the Ombudsman to confirm how many staff had been assigned to this investigation since 2009 and how much funding had been requested for this aspect of its investigation. Has anyone been charged as a result of their inquiries? It said, it's not appropriate to discuss the number and nature of the staff involved in that investigation nor is it appropriate to discuss its operational resourcing in any detail. However, the office want to assure the families of those linked to the allegations that the first stage of the investigation is proceeding according to plan and has not been hampered in any way through a lack of resourcing. Some of the families of the victims are also deeply troubled by the fact that they had thought that both investigations into the alleged killers 
and the police handlers were being supervised by a specially established oversight panel consisting of Nula alone and a leading barrister, Richard Harvey. But in reality, the panel is only looking at the investigation into loyalists. One of the concerns that, that Richard Harvey and I have sitting as the independent monitoring panel for the, for the police, um, ongoing police investigations is that if the police ombudsman isn't doing the, the handler and controller stuff, if they're not investigating that, but the police are investigating murders, it's not impossible that you might end up with somebody charged in court who turns around in court and says, well, actually, my handler told me I could do this. And then there would be serious problems. So it's very important that the police ombudsman is working as fast as the police are. Some of those who criticise the speed of the investigation into handlers believe that the failure of the recent Supergrass trial may have been a deliberate attempt to frustrate justice. People other than special branch handlers and controllers have been used as scapegoats to, uh, if you like, promote in a disproportionate way uh, and downsize uh, the key uh, sensitive investigation that needs to take place, and that is a full-scale criminal investigation against the special branch handlers and controllers. That hasn't happened. Instead, there has been a diversion and a focus of money and resources millions of pounds to promote a, what on one view could be perceived as a, uh, a showcase supergrass trial uh, to the exclusion of the other core component of ballast. It's a view shared by the Committee on the Administration of Justice. It is a mystery to us sitting on the, on the outside of this as to why no other prosecutions have taken place prior to this um, in relation to the matters that were uncovered in the ballast report that would have used other types of evidence that would have been perhaps somewhat more effective um, than the type of evidence that has been uh, presented in the recent trial. Why do you think? Is there an effort to prevent either embarrassment or to cover up the uh, misconduct or criminal behaviour of police officers and if that is the case that's simply unacceptable in a democratic society. No, no, one, no one is above the law. There is now growing speculation that it is the forthcoming Gary Haggerty trial that will finally bring the issue of police handlers and their agents to a head. Haggerty turned supergrass after he was charged with the murder of John Harbinson in 1997. The taxi driver's body was found dumped in an alleyway near Mount Vernon. He had been beaten beyond recognition. Haggerty's co-accused in that case is Mark Haddock. So given the acquittals in the recent Supergrass case, does the UVF have much to fear from the forthcoming Haggerty trial? Well, they might say, look at the Stewart case. Look at how it ended. Will the Haggerty case be, be any different? Will the result be any different? Have we got anything more to fear? Now, I spoke to a senior loyalist, someone who would know Haggerty very well. And he said, compared to the Stuarts, Haggerty would be a star witness, uh, a memory that is sharp as a razor, someone referred to within the loyalist world as Mr. Gadget, someone who walked about with all sorts of gadgetry and recording equipment. And what the loyalist leadership fears is that he may have recorded some of their meetings. And Gary Haggerty reaches out beyond the UVF. At his level of the organisation, he would have sat at meetings of the Combined Loyalist Military Command. So at meetings that brought in the UVF, the UDA and the Red Hand Commando. So do they fear him more than they fear the Stuarts? They would fear his information. They would fear his credibility. Uh, they would fear his status more. Loyalist spokespersons such as Ken Wilkinson warn of dire consequences if the assisting offender system is used to prosecute senior UVF figures. People have to look at what they're bringing down in our community. And I stress quite clearly now that if they continue with these, they're going to destabilise loyalist communities. When you say destabilise, what, what do you mean? Well, the people who uh, are there within loyalism, within the section of loyalism that I deal with, 
are there and have been for the past 30 years working at that to bring people down a, post, a peaceful mode and, and they have achieved that. So why, why take people back? Why take these people out of our society, the old brigade, the stabilizers? Why take them and then leave the young hawks there? In a way, that's a threat. So should we not go after the UVF because it might destabilize that leadership? Or are we not going after the UVF leadership because the real story is where that UVF leadership takes you to? And it takes you to see people and it takes you to see places. And those people in those places are not meant to be seen. One pointer as to how this might happen can be seen in what Ken Wilkinson says is his attitude to the naming of police handlers and their superiors. We all want to know. My community wants to know too who the handlers are. Because these people are damaging our, our society. They're damaging my community. I believe it goes right to the very top. The very top of government? Yeah. I believe that they have to look at their selves. As I said, sometimes these people might have to look in the mirror and instead of continually pointing a finger against us. Last week, Gary Haggerty lost a judicial review on the High Court to access hundreds of taped interviews. He gave police, as an assisting offender, over two years of intensive debriefing. The court heard that on those tapes, Haggerty has made allegations of criminality by him and by others, including police officers. The Haggerty case offers a significant opportunity to advance the investigation of police handlers, according to Nula Olone. There is currently another assisting offender like the Stewart brothers being interviewed, and um, the police ombudsman is fully cited of what's happening in that. So any evidence or any material which is being given by that person which relates to police officer misconduct or criminality, the police ombudsman will already have. And I guess if I were the police ombudsman, that would all be being followed up. It seems to me from what is being said in the office that they haven't got to that stage yet. Last night, the police ombudsman told us that following a referral from the PSNI chief constable, the office is investigating allegations of police criminality made by an assisting offender. In the meantime, John Flynn says he will keep fighting until he gets justice. He's taking a judicial review against the police ombudsman and the chief constable to explain the lack of movement in the current investigation into alleged collusion. Would you encourage former special branch handlers and their superiors to cooperate in any future inquiry? Yeah, I think that people should cooperate uh, as much as possible. I would urge people, in as much as they feel they can themselves, to come forward and to cooperate, because it's in the interest of all of us to make sure that the truth comes out, but not just the truth, but the justice is done. Uh, and that's the key point as far as the public are concerned. Victims do get justice. As to whether or not the role of loyalist and Republican informants and their handlers throughout the Troubles will ever see the light of day, opinions are divided. We're meant to live with this notion that this was a place of warring tribes that had within it an honest referee. The honest referee became a player in the war. And that's why we talk about the dirty war and its ugly truths. And I think that's why there will always be barriers in the way of a truth process. And it's why we will never have MI5, the special branch, the FRU, the army, the police in the same room uh, with uh, the IRA and the loyalists. Do you think the truth will ever come out? I think the truth has a way of coming out eventually, yes. I don't think anyone would have ever expected that what we reported in the ballast report would ever come out. I don't think they would have expected that what we've seen since then would have come out. So I think, yes, eventually it will come.